Hi, I'm Liam Milan. In this video, we're going to look at Ableton Live's Spectrum Analyzer. So Spectrum is in audio effects. And basically what it is, is a visualization tool that lets us see the frequency content over time of our mix or individual sounds as well. So there's various different uh, variables on this. If we look at EQ8 to start with, actually, there's a similar aspect to, to what we can see. we have low to mid to high frequencies available to watch over time. Except EQ8 doesn't have many uh, variables to how we can uh, change the options of how it displays what we're seeing. It does have a block size and a refresh rate and an average, which I'll explain on Spectrum in a minute, but that's where it stops in terms of analysis. So if we move over to Spectrum, we have this block rate, we have the refresh and the average. We also have the choice of what it listens to, whether it listens to the stereo signal left and right, or whether we just want to listen to the left signal independently to the right signal. We also have an option in terms of, of how the information is shown to us in terms of the, the way the frequency display looks and also the, the way that the actual uh, the information of volumes of different frequencies is shown to us too. So like EQA, if we actually double click on the display, we create a larger viewing window. And what we have down the left-hand side is our volume in decibels. And then we have our frequencies running in uh, at the moment in uh, tens. So we have 100, then 1,000 or 1K. Then we have 10K as, as well. And that's what these lines represent. So um, I'm just going to turn down the actual audio output of this for a minute, just so I can better kind of explain what's going on as we go. So if I change the block size, you'll see what it's doing. It's changing the resolution of the frequencies that can be displayed at any one time. So like all things, the more detail a computer can provide for you, whether it's sonically or, or visually, when it's visualizing stuff, the more computational demand it will put on your computer. So although in theory, having a higher block size means great, we can see more information at any given time, you also find that your computer may slow down and to the point where the audio starts breaking up because it cannot deliver the audio in time as you ask for it. So. Um, from a personal point of view, I, I kind of usually watch my mixes in a block size of uh, uh, 4096. Um, if your computer struggles with that, you can go for a lower resolution, but I'll, I'll run through them and you'll kind of get a sense of how it looks different. Okay, so you see it's more simplified in terms of the frequency content there. So the refresh rate that we have uh, basically is how long it takes until it takes another set of block samples. So how long does it take until it updates the information that's going here? So I set that to a very low refresh rate. Increase the block size, do the same. So you can see with the higher block size especially, it's more like a snapshot update. It's not moving with every contour of the music changing in terms of the volumes of the frequencies. It's more flash, 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 flash. So this uh, one allows you to keep up a little bit more with what's, what can be going on visually, but also is less demand on your computer. So if you want a higher block size and your computer may struggle with it, you can change the refresh rate so it's less often that it takes those snapshots of what's going on in your sounds. So again, I'm gonna set it to 4096, because I say that's my, my preference, and around about 40 to 60 milliseconds refresh rate is usually where I find I can visualize what I'm working on quite well. So we have an average aspect here too, and what that does is just smooth out the reaction that it has, and it works a bit more akin to our human hearing. So on the screen we see waveforms, um, and when we're using metering tools that are using what we call a peak metering system, the, the metering can move with every nuance of volume, even the very short transients, whereas a more average signal lets you see a bit more the body of the sound over time and ignores more of the very flashy, quick peaks in volume. Okay. 
Okay, so what we have here is a graph and bins version. As you can see, as the sound's dying down there, all the ambient sounds are dying down. When you see the bins, you actually see what's available in terms of the frequencies it's measuring the volumes for, like a graphic EQ you see on the old hi-fi systems. And when we're on the actual line version, what it's doing is what we call an interpolated line. So it's guessing between this point and this next point in terms of the volume of the frequency, what kind of curve would go between that and then the next point, what kind of curve would go there. So visually, it's your own preference, but visually a line to me looks more pleasing on the eyes. It's still got the same resolution of information. It's just the actual points of the, the, the frequencies peaking um, are smoothed off a little bit in transition to the next one, the next measurement in terms of frequencies. So we have a max value here, which um, if I actually just turn this auto off for a minute, I'll explain what it does in a minute, but I'll just turn it off. If I uh, turn the max off, and then turn it on, So uh, much like when we press play and we see the last hit peak on a, an output of a channel, every time we press start and stop, that will reset. So what this is doing is that top thin, that, sorry, that top transparent looking line is basically recording for this frequency, this is the highest on this play that this frequency has ever been. And you kind of get a general overview of how loud things have ever got. So that's quite useful, especially if you uh, play a track all the way through, you might see that at one point suddenly one like one collection of sounds suddenly creates a larger peak in one section of your song versus the rest of the song. And it may be something you want to have a look into and try and resi uh, reduce that peak from happening and, and overloading your mix um, as it plays back. So we have different types of representations of the frequencies here. We have a linear view where we're literally seeing equal spacing for the increment of frequencies. So it's not the normal view we have for spectral analy analysis, but it can be quite useful to see it this way for more scientific reasons where we want to just easily identify where, where frequencies are in relation to seeing these, these boundary points here, 5K, 10K, 15K and 20K. So we have equal divisions. Logarithmic is, is a power to, so it's a multiplication every time you see it, it's multiplied. So as I mentioned earlier, 100, 10 times that, 1,000, 10 times that, 10,000. So when we're generally opening up spectrum, spectral analysis for music making, which you will be doing if you're loading in plug-in versions of spectral analyzers, you'll tend to see this view as your first default, default view. The other view, the linear one, you may find more in scientific uh, machinery, which people will use for electronic testing and so on as well. So the last aspect we have here is um, a natural musical scale option. So if you understand the relationship of frequencies and how they can relate to different musical intervals and also how they can be multiplied again and again to create octaves of themselves if we just double the value each time, that's useful to know to, to figure out what is musically going on in a sound and what peaks might mean what within a sound that you're looking at. But this tool lets you just kind of see the musical scale and then see in relation to where you're seeing peaks of certain sounds, where they are in terms of on a musical keyboard. So it's a very, very useful tool for that. So the button I pressed before, which I didn't have a chance to explain was this auto and range option. So the auto button basically, as soon as you press play, it quickly gets an idea of what the highest peak and the lowest peak of your music is that's currently playing. Then um, it will scale the display based on how diverse the music is. If it's like this, where it's got a very constant lo um, low to mid level of noise running through or, or background information, it will scale itself to best represent what's moving within your signal. So if I press play now, you'll notice the whole thing will just scale quickly to the, the sound that's playing. So my bass section here looks like it's peaking around about zero decibels. And then across here, it's, it's a lot lower in volume in terms of how loud those frequencies are compared to the, the loudest, which is the lower frequencies. But until this point where the whole thing's died down to an ambient low level, it's saying that the lowest kind of frequencies, sorry, the lowest volume of the frequencies within my song ever go is about minus 90 decibels. That's kind of the headroom between loudest peaks and the average 
background level of my track. Now, if you were working on something way more dynamic, maybe some ambient music or even playing sort of classical music, you may find that this scales a lot more between different passages of the songs that you're working on. But if, you, if like myself, you're working more on kind of four, uh, forward sounding electronic music, you'll find that there's a more limited range of, of dynamics within, within the work that you're going for. Now, if you don't like the way that that looks, the way it keeps adapting, you find it hard to kind of figure out what you're seeing versus what the measurements are on the side, you can fix this. So you turn it to range mode here, and then you choose. So I can set it so at the top, let's say I have it at the moment at plus 40 decibels, but if I set it to zero decibels, that's now a fixed top range of, of uh, volume for my frequencies, and that won't move as I'm analyzing. So if I wanna look at this for a while, I can have this as a fixed range on the left-hand side. And then the, the kind of the lowest possible volume within the, the work that I'm doing, if I want to go by the guide that it gave me before, I could set that to around about n minus 90. And then it will give me the same as it was giving me when I was watching it in auto mode, except it's just not going to keep adapting and moving around. So it's less distracting to, to analyze. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of technical side of using Spectrum. Um, the application of it can happen in a few different places. It could be useful to have it on tracks you might be having a problem with. So it might be a, a specific sound that you've maybe, maybe a Foley recording and you like the timbre of it, but there's certain things in there that are not quite sounding right. So what you do is you, you drag the spectrum for either from the browser or from wherever you're using it in the project over to the track that has the problem. And then you can identify based on what you're seeing there, what might be sounds that are part of the, the motion of the sound and there may be other things sort of moving around that are not as associated with the sound shape that you hear in there. And you might want to use an EQ to either remove or reduce those as they go through. As I've done, you might have it on your, your mix bus, so your master track, and use it as a means to analyze what you're working on. If you have a reference track in your project, you can always play that, look at it, and then play your track, look at it, and get a sense of what's different. Now, if you're doing that, you, you probably want to have it set to the range fixed mode, so it doesn't keep adapting differently to a commercial release to yours. You can see yours in with the grid axis staying the same, so you know what yours genuinely looks like compared to theirs. But that's a really useful tool. And on that note, um, a really good technique which trains your ears and also helps you look a in a different way into what's going on in other people's music is to literally spend a good amount of time loading in all sorts of you know uh, good reference tracks into your project and look at them through Spectrum and start getting a sense of what people are doing. I remember when I've looked at tracks in the past before, I've noticed that for certain sub parts based on what's going on with the melody, rather than there being a conflict between a kick drum and the bass play at the same time, for that note, the bass just doesn't play at all. And then they bring the bass back in. And it's stuff I wouldn't necessarily have heard with my ears, but to visualize it, you can really start to see the relationship of all the different instruments going on inside the mix. So we've looked at Ableton Live's Spectrum Analyzer. Uh, we've looked at how we can change its, its settings, and now those will help you understand how the settings work on EQ8 as well. And we've looked at a few different contexts of why we might choose different displays and why we might apply the process or the visualization at different points within our projects as we work.